I think I can, uh, what Pastor Leroy was just describing, you can see my dilemma now when I open many pages of my Bible. <laughs> Sometimes pieces fall out and people scramble to pick them up for me so I can tape them back in again. But uh, I'm reluctant to let this Bible go because I've got so many notes in it. And it's a huge task to transfer them. If you've, ever, if you've ever done that, you know what a time it takes to do it. I've started the process, but I've had this Bible rebound twice already, and I think it won't take another binding. So its days are numbered. Oh, I've had to memorize them. Yes, I can basically quote what's missing. That's not the worst page, by the way. There are worse pages than that. <laughs> I would like to express my deep gratitude to the leadership of the conference here. Uh, they're so supportive and so encouraging to me to come into a conference that has this kind of spirit. And, and Pastor Leroy especially, who's just fired up on, on these topics, your support is incredibly uh, well received by me. Because I know that God can bless uh, a conference like this if the leadership and the pastors are fired up on something as beautiful as the righteousness of Jesus. Is there a big amen to that? Amen. You have no idea how refreshing this is to me. To find I go to big churches, I was in a big church of a thousand members recently and 30 people came out for the weekend to study righteousness by faith. 30 people out of a thousand. I just said, you know, this is so sad. And, and that night I had a dream about the time of trouble and I saw many of those people running to and fro, trying to get an understanding of things that they had every opportunity to receive, but they didn't take it. Disneyland was more attractive than, than coming to a, a weekend in the Word of God. What's happened to us huh, as a people when those kind of things take place? So I, I'm just rejoicing in the spirit up here. I don't mind telling you that it's such a refreshing development. I was invited into a cabin last night till about 11 o'clock last night. We sat around in a cabin with a a cup of Ovaltine, which I haven't done for years. You know, I grew up drinking Ovaltine. And, uh, and we just chatted and shared our faith. And this is normal and uplifting fellowship, isn't it? And I had no idea how hungry I was for something like that, just the intimacy of sitting there, sharing and, and drinking our hot drink and, and uplifting one another with, with the things of God. That was such a refreshing moment. I thank God for that, believe me. What was that? There's room for you here in the Maritime. I couldn't hear you. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> she takes the bait so well. I'm glad she's sitting down the front. <laughs> There's room for him here in the Maritime. Oh, she finally got it up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first guy we voted into the Moncton Church, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first arrived in the desert in Southern California five years ago, I slipped out to Desert Hot Springs, which is a little town. It's not really a very attractive town either. I can almost see it from where I live in Palm Springs, but it only has about 30 members in it. But I went in and in the middle of the church service, they stood up and voted me into membership without even asking me. I said, I, <laughs> I love that kind of spirit. I do have a burden on my heart this morning as we get underway because I'm well aware of the fact that when you present these materials... Sometimes they can be a rock of offence to some people. And even though I have difficulty myself in comprehending why someone would be offended by the uplifting of Jesus, it happens all the time. And I just wanted to apologise this morning if in any way I have offended anybody by lifting Jesus up in the way that I'm doing especially if it's cut across your heart and you found yourself resisting something that is so beautiful. And I apologize for my inefficiency as a presenter if that's happened to you. And please come to me and let's pray together because I'm seeking to be an instrument so that the beauty of Jesus can be seen and not me coming through this. And I'm well aware of my abilities to get in the way, don't worry. God has rebuked me so many times that I am to be totally out of the picture here so you can just see Jesus. So if for whatever reason at all you're not rejoicing at the moment because of what God has offered you in Christ, I want to pray with you 
and encourage you because this is not a time to be offended by the beauties of what God has offered us through the righteousness of his Son, Jesus. We ought to be singing his praises, shouldn't we? We ought to be lifting our hearts up and rejoicing. Sometimes people say to me, but it can't be that simple. And I just shake my head in amazement at the ability of human beings to complicate what God has made unutterably clear. I'm going to say it again this morning that there is nothing within ourselves with which we can commend ourselves to God. There's not one deed I have ever done that was done by me without Christ being in me. I am incapable of anything good, holy and pure. It is not my natural inclination. Is it yours? So the second big principle is going to come out this morning because you've got the first principle set in concrete, haven't you? Let's hear the first principle again this morning. Oh, we've got a couple here and they both have it. He was there yesterday and she's with us today. Praise the Lord. I have to play in the cradle roll division, so I leave every day. (laughs) Say it again, would you please? Anything that happened to Jesus, God considers having happened to me. I'll give her back the microphone. Surely she's not content. Even the cradle roll gives you a better response than that, don't they? Don't accept this. Please do not accept it. These people are capable of praise here. I've proved it. Come on, say it again. Anything that happened to Jesus, God considers as having happened to me. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. And she hasn't even been here all the time, but she's got it clear. Praise the Lord. And the second principle coming through very profound principle here this morning because we're making a little transition from the death of Jesus today to his life. It's Jesus in me who is not attracted to sin. Let that penetrate the thinking part of your brain this morning. It's Jesus in me who is not attracted to to sin and the reverse of that it's Jesus in me who is drawn to righteousness and holiness and all those things it's not me getting a little more pure every day so that I'm less carnal and a little more spiritual it's, that's not happening it all hinges on whether I am willing to take the faith step every morning of my life and to come to the cross and see the broken body of Jesus and look up to my Father in heaven and say, thank you, Father, that once again for another day of my life I can begin my day by claiming the privilege of having my guilt, my condemnation, my judgment, my second death taken from me and placed on someone who did not deserve it. And this morning I believe it by faith and I want to express my gratitude to you, Father, for lifting all that from me because now I'm ready to have another day of my life with Jesus in me. And the good news this morning is if Jesus is in you, It's Jesus who is not attracted to sin. It's Jesus who is drawn to holiness and righteousness and purity and all those things that are foreign to our carnal selves. I'm trying to gauge the response out here this morning. It's it's what I call the Canadian response. It's kind of (laughs) and I know it's a reflective processing response and I've learned that from experience (laughs) (laughs) but you at least let it out (laughs) okay okay please we just hang on for the mic to come to you there it is Uh, so we change that sentence that 
that uh, all things done to us is done to Jesus. Because sometimes I can get really offended by by another person. Yes. But they have to go through Jesus before they can hit me. Okay. It's another way of expressing the same thing. Thank you for that. It's a very acute observation. I'm glad you're sitting in the front row. I love these little observations. Thank you very much. So our challenge is not to become more holy, which we'd all love to have. Our challenge is to remain in Christ. Because if we are in Christ, we have it all. We have it all. We have our past sins taken care of. We have our present habits offered the challenge and the privilege of victory and overcoming. We have our future already provided for in Christ. You know, several years ago I had the privilege of attending a lecture in London. Uh -oh. I hope this pen was as <laughs> good as you told me. <laughs> Well, oh, okay. You did say it was erasable. Yes, it says erasable. <laughs> uh, a number of years ago, I had the privilege of attending a lecture in London. I was the ministerial director at that time of the Southwestern Union Conference in, headquartered in Texas. And they sent me over to this lecture in London to sit at the feet of a world-renowned physicist and I didn't claim to have a great knowledge of physics. I'm always in awe of physics, actually. But this guy was a Christian physicist. And he tried to help us understand the theory of relativity, and which I've never understood, quite frankly. But he tried to make it simple. And he used this little illustration that I've never forgotten. He drew a circle on the board and he said, that's the earth. And if you were capable of taking a journey away from the earth, traveling at the speed of light. And we know how fast light travels, don't we? How fast does it travel? 186,000 miles a second. It's the fastest speed known to man. So, so far I'm computing this, okay. I'm going to take a journey traveling at the speed of light. That's pretty fast. It takes light about one and a quarter seconds to come from the moon to us. I mean, it's pretty fast. And he said, and you went on the journey for 24 hours. But you're traveling at the speed of light. So you went out for 12 hours and you came back. And so far we're all saying, okay, we can follow this. And he said, uh, when you arrive back on the earth 24 hours later, something remarkable would have taken place. We all said, okay, well, what could have happened in 24 hours? He said, when you arrive back on the earth again, 1,000 years would have gone by. That's when I fell off the seat. 1,000 years would have passed by. And he explained to us that when you speed up, the faster you go until you reach the speed of light, Time expands the faster you go. This was Einstein's brilliant discovery. And you're going so fast that you're traveling at the speed of light that what used to be a 24-hour period has now expanded into 1,000 years of time. And he said, if there is a being capable of traveling at that speed, and of course my mind was already taking hold of the biblical passage that says a day with the Lord is like I said, oh, hell, even your God must be traveling at the speed of light. <laughs> then I said, well, God is light. Of course he's traveling at the speed of light. And things started to come together. But this physicist, brilliant man, he said, if there is a being who's capable of traveling at speeds like that, then there's no such thing in his existence as past or future. Those are terms associated with beings who have beginnings and endings. How do you have a, a past if there's no beginning? 
And he said, because God is traveling at that speed, he lives in the great eternal now. That's why he's called biblically, not the great I was, but the great I am. And he says, so whether you like it or not, God's present, because of the speed he's traveling at, includes your past. I thought, wow. And God's present includes your future. God is in your entire span of life. It's only a fraction of the time in which he lives. Thus he can, and he, he then went on to say, your whole life is still happening. It's only passed to you. But somebody travelling at that speed, he sees it still happening in his present. And he challenged us, how big is your God? And he said to us, you know, you may be sitting here in a crisis. Today you, you could be, have just gone through a death in your family. You may have gone through a divorce, a very painful experience recently. You may have gone through a disaster economically. You may have been out of work for the last 12 months. It's very common today. I live in a state myself that has a 10% unemployment rate, which, you know, with the population of California, that's a lot of people. A lot of people. And he said, it doesn't matter what experience you may have gone through or you may be passing through, but God has made absolute provision for your past, present and future in the cross of Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow. Because the cross has covered all your past sins. The cross brings the living Christ into you presently and Jesus is already in your future living the life that you will eventually embrace. You have it all at the cross. And at that moment I began to realize that I had far too small a picture of God. That there was no circumstance in my life, nothing absolutely that God could not unveil to me. Wow, think of that. <laughs> because he's already there. So I flew from London back to Dallas-Fort Worth, got out of the plane, went to a telephone box. We didn't have cell phones in those days. Ran around the airport a little bit and jumped in my car, which I'd left parked at, you know, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport's a very big airport. It's about two miles down to the exit gate. And as I was exiting, this girl at the box, and this always bugs me when this happens, she didn't look at me. She just put her hand out like this. Very impersonal. So I put my little card in her hand and she put it in her machine and I'd forgotten how much it was. 50 or 100 dollars. Anyway, and so she puts her hand out, still not looking at me for the money. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I went like this to find my billfold. No billfold. Hmm. I know I had it in the airport because I pulled it out at the telephone booth. I said, wow. So I opened my briefcase, I searched the car, and this girl's getting really impatient with me. The cars are piling up behind me. Well, she said, are you going to pay or not? I said, well, I would like to. <laughs> but I think I've left my billfold somewhere in the airport. Well, she said in her Texas drawl, you know, you can wave goodbye to that. I said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> she said, take it from me, it's gone. I said, I tell you what, if you'll just raise the gate and let me go through, I'll slip back and have a look anyway. She said, you don't go through the gate until you pay. I said to myself, oh, one of those. <laughs> I said, well, you know, about a hundred yards back there was a place where you can do a U-turn. I'll just reverse back, even though there's 50 cars behind me. I will reverse back. I'll make them all move. And I'll make a legal U-turn and go back. She said, that's illegal. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. You're probably a much more calm individual than myself and remember I had just come from a seminar where my picture of God had expanded exponentially I mean I was believing so I thought in a God who was totally in control even of my future there are no surprises for God and I lost it I didn't get angry so much as I I can use words sometimes uh, devastatingly so I looked at this girl and I said, well, 
I can't go forward because I've got no money. I can't go back because that's illegal. I know what I'll do. I'll just camp here for the night. And as soon as I said, and I know you would never lose it like that, but I lost it. And as soon as I said it, the Holy Spirit went, knock, knock. <laughs> what about the one who was and is and is to come? The one who's already in your future. I said, oh. And God said, by the way, this girl doesn't know me. What picture of me are you giving her? I said, I hate to think about it. <laughs> well, God says, tell her that we've been in communication. And when she hears this, she will open the gate and let you go back to the airport. And by the way, I'm looking after your billfold. That's what God said to me. So I grinned at this girl with my most agreeable grin. <laughs> I said, hey, look, uh, I've just been talking to my father. And she looks in the car and she says, <laughs> she says he must be pretty thin. <laughs> I said, no, my father. Oh, she said, oh, she said, this is going to be good. I can feel it coming. I said, trust me, this is very good. I said, my father in heaven just told me that when you heard this, you would open the gate and let me go through. And he said, I will find my billfold when I go back even though 45 minutes has gone by and thousands of people cruising around that airport, he's told me that he's already in my future, he's taking care of it. She just shook her head. She said, I thought I'd heard it all. <laughs> and she raised the gate. She says, get moving. <laughs> I forced myself to drive slowly. I wanted to race back to the airport. But I said to myself, I'm living by faith at this moment. I'm not going to speed back to the airport. Why should I speed if God's in control? So I drove back carefully, parked the car. I put my hands in my pockets and I forced myself to walk in like this. You know, <laughs> when everything in me wanted to go racing into the airport, but I wouldn't do it. And I walked in, came to the telephone booth, nothing. My old enemy whispered in my ear, who are you kidding? God's not interested in a billfold. I said, get thee behind me. My God is in my future. He's in control. And I started thinking, where could I have possibly left my... Then it struck me, oh my goodness, the story gets quite interesting here. I'd been to the men's room. And all of a sudden I knew I had dropped it in the men's room. I'd gone into one of those little cubicles. I just knew it was in there. So I walked into this restroom... Now, if you want to really attract attention to yourself in a public restroom, go in and knock on the door of an occupied cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting bolder by faith here. <laughs> so I went in and I knocked on that door and there's a surprised gasp inside. I said, excuse me, sir, would you mind throwing out to me, this was my faith statement now, my billfold which must be sitting somewhere on the floor in there. Everyone in the restroom is watching me. <laughs> and as I stood there for several seconds, my billfold came flying over the top of the door. And I caught it. And, you know, everything that of great value to me, not the money so much, but your credit cards, even my green card, you know, my ability to remain in the U.S., it was all in this billfold. Anyway, there was not a single thing missing, not even a dollar of money. You know? And the, the voice from inside said, boy, you're lucky. I said, no, I am blessed. And I drove back down. I made sure I went out the same gate. She wasn't looking again. She put out her hand. So I put the card in it, but I didn't let go. And it kind of went like this a couple of times. <laughs> and she looks down and says, oh, it's you. <laughs> I said, yes. And I held up the billfold. You should have seen her face. I said, by the way, I know you're busy. I know there are hundreds of cars coming through, but take one minute of your life to let me share with you how much God loves me and how much he loves you. And I saw a little tear in the corner of her eye. I knew God was speaking to her heart at that moment. And I sped away from that place and I lifted up my heart and I rejoiced. And I'm really challenging you this morning. How big is your God? Is he big enough to save you? Or has he made the journey so difficult, so complicated, so narrow, so impossible...
that none of us are ever going to make it. And I get depressed when I run into people who do not have the confidence that God is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him by faith. Look what he's offered you through the death of Jesus. Is there one person here this morning? Only one out of this vast audience. Let's test the waters now in the Maritime Conference. Is there one person here this morning? And please don't tell me about yourself. I'll have cardiac arrest. I hate doing this. I hate calling for public testimony because people stand up and they tell me about their arthritis, their financial problems, their struggles. And the one thing they somehow can't ever seem to get out is their gratitude to God for what he's offered them through the atoning death of Jesus. Is there one person in the room this morning who can actually stand up at this moment and say to God, thank you from the depths of my heart for the atoning death of Jesus. Because by faith this morning, I'm praising you for the privilege of being justified. To be declared righteous, I don't feel it. When I looked in the mirror this morning, I didn't see it. But by faith I believe it, that you have actually accepted Jesus Christ in my stead. I am overwhelmed. And that you would look at me as though I'm righteous. What have I done? Oh, hallelujah, we've got a man on his feet here. A brave man. Go ahead, look up and talk to him. I don't want to hear any stories. I want you to look up. And praise him for exactly what I've asked you to do. Heavenly Father, you have given me understanding and a desire to overcome my defects. And I want to thank you for your love and the care that you have for me. And that I may walk with you for the rest of my days. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. He's on first base. He has not hit a home run, unfortunately. Because you only left the essential ingredient out of your praise. But it was a beautiful praise you had. <laughs> I want to hear somebody. This is a hard thing for me to get. I've almost quit asking for this because it's such a challenge to get it out of people. And that was beautiful praise coming out then. I want to hear how grateful you are for the atoning death of Jesus. What is God offering you through Jesus? What are you taking hold of? by faith this morning. Our sister's on her feet here. I'm really, really thankful that I can stand here and say that Christ died for me. I watched the movie called The Passion and there was women cleaning the blood off the floor. And Jesus poured his blood out for me and I'm grateful. Thank you for getting the ball rolling this morning. Wow, thank you. A focus on the death of Jesus. Anyone else claiming one of these marvellous promises that God has offered you through the atoning death of Jesus? Anyone else on their feet here this morning? Hallelujah. Okay. Here's a mic here. Heavenly Father, we just I just want to thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing and all that you continue to do and that you are in control that I've been reconciled to you that we've been reconciled to you through our Savior so thank you for, for providing that gift for amen. us amen. thank you thank you very much he's claiming reconciliation is there an amen to that amen, amen. reconciled through the death of Jesus is there one more Back there, on her feet, okay, back here. I want to thank the Lord this morning that I have a new life, that because of his death, I am new. Amen. And Amen. I praise the Lord that all things are new and mm. that he is amazingly powerful. Amen. Thank you. The statement of faith here this morning, my hope is building. My hope, one last person, anyone else who just can't hold back, there's a hand right over here. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that for your atoning sacrifice for me and that there is now no condemnation. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. She hit the nail on the head. 
Thank you so much. Through the death of Jesus, incredibly, I am not condemned. Why not? Because my... She's done it again. Those lips are moving and nothing coming out again. <laughs> this is a family characteristic. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> we are not condemned for the simple reason. Christ died for me and uh, covered me. And what fell on him if you're not condemned? My sins. If you're not condemned, what fell on him? I'm trying to put my the spoon in your mouth me. now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for the body. Huh? <laughs> She's a trier. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We are not condemned because our condemnation has already fallen on Jesus. Wow. So we're coming back. This is our third day on these two verses. It's time we brought this to conclusion, isn't it? And they want the boards for another meeting tomorrow, so we're going to have... Well, hopefully they're going to be able to erase it. <laughs> so listen very carefully now as we come back to Romans 5, 9 and 10. There's something here that's very beautiful. Having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Having been reconciled by his death, we shall be saved by his life. Salvation is associated with the life of Jesus. Despite the fact that the whole Christian world is fond of saying, Jesus died to save me, Paul says Jesus lived. It's something about his life that brings salvation to me. Salvation, as I've been saying from the beginning, always involves two things. An accomplished fact and... An ongoing process. These two factors are always present when it comes to salvation. And by the way, Paul contrasts now the A statements with the B statements. Look at the two verses very carefully and see who can find the two little words that Paul uses to contrast the A statements with the B statements. We're looking from here to here now. He makes a contrast with this, with this, and he uses two little words. And Pastor Leroy, we haven't given him a lot of chance to contribute, so let's give him a chance to jump in here. Much more. You can see it made a profound impact on this audience. Say it again, huh? <laughs> Much more. Much more than what? Than even all that the death of Jesus has brought me. They're stunned. The, the Canadian response has kicked in. They're processing. Repeat that again. Listen very carefully to this excellent statement. Listen carefully. All of what Jesus' death has bought me is not the complete picture. There is now much more we're going to be getting into. Thank you so much for that. When I first heard this, you know what I said to myself? What could be much more than the atoning death of Jesus? Paul's saying there's something much more than that. And there are many people who've come to the cross and they've seen the mercy of God. They've seen his compassion. They've seen his provision for sin. But they've never gone much more. So the one thing you can never end up with, by the way, if you're preaching righteousness by faith, you can never end up in the camp of once saved, always saved. Because if you've come here, and you haven't moved into here, you haven't entered into salvation yet. And those who cease to come to the cross daily, they start to lose their grasp, don't they? They lose their hold on the atoning death of Jesus. This teaching, this understanding will prevent you from ever falling into that trap. And it's an, it's an important trap to avoid at all costs. There's something much more. By the way, the first time the word salvation pops up in the New Testament. The root word for salvation is Matthew 1, 21. Have a look at it. It's a well-known verse. I'm always interested in the first time that things appear in Scripture. The first time the, word, the root word for salvation appears in the New Testament, Matthew 1, 21. For we shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save. save. There's the word. Save his people from? Oh, wow. 
Not in their sins. Thank you, Wanda. Not in their sins, but from their sins. There's a whole school of thought out there today that is painting such a liberal picture of God that he actually loves and saves people in their sins. Nothing could be further from the truth. If God is in you, I said it this morning, I'm going to say it again, it's Jesus in you who is not attracted to sin. The whole purpose of salvation is to deliver us from our sins. I'm going to challenge the traditional schools of thought here this morning. Some people think eternal life or salvation has to do with living forever and ever and ever. It's not true. Some people think eternal life is making it through the gates of heaven. It's not true. Eternal life has to do with God in you delivering you from your sins. And the one who is in you is eternal. Did you know that the only reason Jesus' life is eternal is because it's built on pure, unselfish love? It took me years to see this. Anything based on sin and selfishness will self-destruct ultimately. This world would have self-destructed long ago if God hadn't intervened. But anything based on pure, unselfish love can endure forever. That's why the life of Jesus is eternal. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5 and let's confirm this. 1 John chapter 5. We're coming back to Romans. 1 John 5. A lot of confusion over eternal life. 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Did you actually hear that? It doesn't say this life is offered by his son. It says this life is in his son. And the next verse, he who has the son has the life. And he who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Has it finally penetrated your mind that eternal life is not a reward? Are you hearing it already? Are you hearing 1 John 5, 11 and 12? What are you hearing? Do you want to bring it out? No, it's now. It's not next week. It's not when Jesus All right, it's a present reality. You're on first base. Do you want to hit a home run? Look, go back to 1 John 5, 11 again and have a look at it. God has given us eternal life and this life is in so, Wanda, make a profound statement for us. Now, you can do this, by the way. I know you have a radical mind here. Come on, let it come out. <laughs> what are we learning about eternal life? It's not it's a future in, reward. You've seen that. You've actually seen it now. It's in Jesus living through me. Oh, it's in Jesus living through me. She's on third base. Come on, hit that home run now. Let the radical side of your nature come fully out now. If eternal life is in Jesus. I have it now. I have it now. You've already made that point and it's an excellent point. But there's one thing you haven't said yet. Eternal life is not a reward. It's not. It's a present reality. She's made that point. That's the third time it's come out now. I believe me, I have got it now. But there is another point yet that has not emerged. This is a radical thought. I thought she was on the verge of getting it here. Who's getting the radical thought here? There's probably a forest of hands up over here. Can't have life okay, it's not you a bad statement. But you haven't hit it squarely yet. It is a gift. That Christ That's not what you said the first time. I have acute hearing. I heard you. <laughs> so let's go back to your initial statement, which was a much better statement than the second one. <laughs> It is Jesus in me who is not attracted to sin. He delivered me from... So make a... Ra can, you can do this now. I know you have a radical mindset. It just doesn't always come out. But <laughs> <laughs> so eternal life is actually... Who said that? Was that you? Too bad it wasn't you, huh? <laughs> Marilyn? 
eternal life. I heard, was it you, was it, Louis? Don't, don't say it, please. Let's give them a chance here to, to bring this out. Cal, yes? If Jesus, if eternal life is in Jesus and Jesus is in me, then eternal life is in me also. All right, it's a fair statement. You're kind of on your face in the dirt and your fingers are almost touching home plate, you know? <laughs> but unfortunately, your eyes are getting full of dirt, you know? And you can't see where the base is. <laughs> Come on, touch it. You're almost there, man. That's an excellent statement coming out. Excellent statement. This is a radical thought. I'm just wondering if anyone's actually allowing themselves to hear it. If eternal, don't call out now, if eternal life is not a reward and we have it now and it's in Jesus Christ, then we've got to get rid of all of our preconceptions and actually admit that eternal life is... I'm trying to take a hand now. You know, I never take voices coming up. A hand. Over here. Okay, there's a hand up here. Eternal life is in us now. That's already come out six times. All right. We have the final confirmation of it here. Come on, who's moving beyond that thought? Well, this young guy over here who would love to have taken the credit earlier is being resurrected. Okay. We are living eternal life right now. We are in eternal life. All right, again, confirmation of this point. That's the seventh confirmation. Okay. <laughs> but it's a, good, it's a good thing to keep affirming here. Oh, now, should we let the president jump in on this? Eternal. Oh, let's give him a shot here. <laughs> Eternal life is a quality, not a time component. Eternal life is a quality, not a time component. Okay, I'm not sure whether you've moved forward or backward a millimeter there. <laughs> this is a radical thought. Oh, now, this couple over here, they've done pretty well, even though they keep hiding in the back rows back here. I think it's Jesus continually in me. So why did you have to add that last bit? Why didn't you just simply say? Give it to your wife and see what she's going to add to this. It's Jesus in me. Oh, you've added the last bit with him. You've joined hands and jumped off the same bridge. <laughs> They've jumped off the bridge together. What a shame. You were so close. So, oh, hallelujah. Okay, we've got a new resurrection down here. Okay. Eternal life is Jesus. Amen. You actually got amens, man. Do you realize that this is a historic moment here? <laughs> Thank you so much. Maybe, praise the Lord, huh? That's excellent, excellent. Maybe Jesus is eternal life. Maybe eternal life is a person, not a quality. Turn to 1 John chapter 1 and confirm this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, verse 2. We're getting radical here now. <laughs> well, let's see how long it took to come out. It must be radical. <laughs> Have a look at verse 2. There's one phrase here. And especially if you're reading an enlightened version, it will come out with great clarity. There's one little phrase in verse 2. It's a description of Jesus. If you're seeing it, and especially if there's one little article in there, or well, wonder has been raised from the dead again. Should we give her a second shot here? I believe so. Okay. Etern eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. You haven't hit the phrase on the head yet, Wanda, but it was a noble attempt. Who's actually seeing the little phrase in this verse? A description of Jesus. It's, we've got a new hand over here, okay. I, I think it's the life appeared. We have seen it and right, testified a, to it. It's another noble attempt here. but We haven't actually had it hit on the head yet directly. Who else is seeing it here? What about this vast body out in the center here? The forest of hands has diminished. Come on, somebody in the center section, who's seeing it? Don't call out now, I'm looking for hands. There's a hand back there, okay? I'm in the center section. We have shown you this eternal life. Where are you reading from? Uh, 
I didn't, I didn't recognize the and word. And bear witness and uh, show unto you that eternal life. Okay, okay, so the part you're emphasizing is? That uh, they have seen the eternal life and they have uh, shown us or witnessed the phrase, to us. The phrase that you are emphasizing is? That the eternal life is Jesus Christ. That the they have phrase been that you are <laughs> emphasizing is? Just give me the phrase. Come on. There's only three words in this little phrase. He's right on target here. If we can get him to call it out now, we'll have it by George. The little phrase. And you said it. I just want to make sure you're hearing it. And your ability now to say it just as a phrase will tell me you've got it. There's only three words in this little phrase. Quickly, before the vultures steal it from you. <laughs> we, we have seen. No, it's not we have seen. Who's going to help him out of this? Over here, David, okay. Over here, we'll, we'll see what is coming out of this group here. This guy was right on target. He had the fish on the hook and then he let it slip off. Let's see what happens here. Life was manifested? No, we still haven't got it yet. Oh, well, right at the back there, okay. The hand that withered up there. Let's give her a shot. Uh. That eternal life. That eternal life. That eternal life. Life. Some versions say, my version says, the eternal life. Jesus is called the eternal life or that eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. He, well that was pretty feeble. He who has the Son therefore has the life because he is the life. And if you let Jesus come into you through the Spirit, His life in you is eternal. In fact, you'll never die. You might sleep, but you'll never die. My mother's funny because she's already a member of the 144,000 and uh, she's not planning to die. And I keep reminding her that she could sleep, but in her mind, sleep and death are the same thing. She said, but I'm only 92. I said, I know. <laughs> That's why I'm urging you to consider that if God doesn't speed things up, you might sleep, but you will never die. Because in you is what? What kind of life? And that life is in. So it all hinges on a relationship with Jesus. I want to tell you, you can have doctrinal purity. But it won't make a scrap of difference if you're not in a living, intimate relationship with Jesus. Because there's nothing in doctrine that can save us. As exciting as it is, and I believe it's exciting to be able to prove what you believe, or I wouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist. But there's nothing in doctrine that can save us. Eternal life is in the Son. He is eternal life. So it's all about a relationship with Jesus. That's why it's much more than what he did with his death because by dying he did something for us. But now, by indwelling us, he faces the incredible challenge of imparting his life to us every single day. And we start to become involved now in the process, don't we? We take hold of him by faith and we start walking and talking. And all of a sudden it hits us. My goodness, it's not me. Have you ever said to yourself, and it's happened to me several times recently, where did that come from? Yes. And I've realized they're not my words. And God says, hey, you're finally realizing it's been me all along. I was leaving home in Washington, D.C. one morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. I was on a committee in the general conference and I was running there and I was late. And I'm the kind of person who needs to eat breakfast. I don't care about the rest of the day, but I need breakfast. So I've been enjoying the very good breakfasts over here. <laughs> anyway, uh, I ran out of the house and I totally forgot to eat anything. I'm in my car and I said, oh my goodness, I didn't eat anything. I was so rushed. Oh well, I'll call into that little strip mall around the corner. And I'll just go to that little French deli that I've been to many times and I'll have a croissant and something simple. So I pulled into the strip mall and, you know, Washington, D.C., 7 o'clock in the morning, there's not one parking space available. I said, ah, Washington. 
So I sat there twiddling my thumbs for several minutes. And finally I saw some tail lights come on, so I quickly raced over. It's very competitive. And I didn't look around, I just simply grabbed the spot and pulled my car in right in front of the deli. I totally failed to see a small van with the name of the deli painted on the side. And I was getting out of my car and I looked in the rear vision mirror and I saw the little Frenchman who owns this deli. I know him but he doesn't know me. I know he's the owner. And he was getting out of his car and you could almost see the smoke coming out of his ears, you know. He was so angry with me. He'd been waiting there, it turns out, for 15 minutes to unload stuff into his own little business. And I didn't see him. And he came over to my car and with his fist he starts pounding on my window, the, the driver's window. So I quickly pushed the button and it went down automatically and I moved myself across to the other side of the car. <laughs> so he's only a little guy so he couldn't reach me. And he stuck his head in. And uh, having no idea, by the way, that I might be able to hear the French, I, I'm sure that didn't occur to him, he starts swearing at me. My vocabulary was enlarged dramatically. I've got a fairly good vocabulary, but my goodness, there were several words that even I hadn't heard. <laughs> but as I listened carefully to what he was saying, apart from the swear words, which I managed to put aside, he was actually calling me a very selfish individual without any regard for anybody else, and he'd been waiting there for 15 minutes, da 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 da, da. So I lifted up my mind and I said to God, you know, my natural inclination is to bop him one on the nose, you know. He's so rude and arrogant. But I said, I need the mind of Jesus at this moment, desperately. God's very good about that, by the way. So a great peace came over me. Anyway, this guy finally ran out of steam and he, he says to me, well, don't you have anything to say? I said, well, it has been a little difficult for me to get a word in uh, up till now. He digested that. He said, well, what do you have to say to yourself? I said, I've only got one thing to say to you. And I was amazed what came out of my mouth. I said, you're, you're absolutely right. What do you mean I'm right? <laughs> well, I said, everything you said, or I said, well, maybe not everything you said about me, but many of the things you just said about me are absolutely true. I am a very selfish man. And I have to admit, I didn't see you. I was not looking for anybody else. I was only concerned about getting the space for myself because I'm in a hurry. He's looking at me, he can't comprehend that I'm not angry at him now. I said, by the way, and this is what shocked me because this is not me. If you know me, this is not me. I've never done this in my life. You know, I'm an Australian. We love a good fight, you know. It's born into us. Anyway, uh, I looked at this guy and I said to him, uh, I'll tell you what, not a big deal. I'll back my car out. I've never done that in my life. I will back my car out. You know, I'm the kind of guy that can say, too bad, buddy. You should have been a little faster, you know. <laughs> Beat it. <laughs> I'll back my car out. You can pull your van in and I'll just wait for the next space. It's really not a big deal and I'm terribly sorry that I failed to see you. And he's going, I mean, had I cursed him, he could have handled that. He didn't know what to do. So I backed out. He pulled in, he started unloading his stuff. I waited five more minutes. I was almost ready to leave when another spot opened up. This time I was a little more careful and I looked around and took the spot. Anyway, I was about to get out of my car for the second time and I looked in the mirror again and the little Frenchman's coming back towards me again. I said, oh my goodness, he's not done with me yet, you know. <laughs> so I got the window down in advance this time and I moved again across the other side of the car. And he stuck his head in the window. And he says to me, I was pretty rude to you a few minutes ago. I said, I believe I can agree with that statement. <laughs> I'm keeping a very straight face, you know. My humour kicks in at a time like this. But he said, you, you were so polite and so kind to me. I said, well, I've got news for you. And I went like this. That was my father in heaven. I said, by the way, you should be very grateful that he spoke and not me. Because <laughs> whenever I give him permission, his words are so much softer than mine. His love is so much deeper and greater than mine. That was my father in heaven that you actually heard. 
He's kind of looking at me with this incredulous look on his face. He said, were you coming in to have some breakfast? I said, I'm trying to. <laughs> he said, you probably know that I own the business. I said, yes, I'm aware of that. And we introduced ourselves. He said, well, look, why don't you come in and have breakfast on me? So, of course, I immediately planned to have a much bigger breakfast. than. <laughs> I said, I might as well have a full breakfast. <laughs> Hang the committee, you know. <laughs> and he said, would it be okay if I joined you for breakfast? I said, look, please be my guest in your own restaurant. <laughs> Let me entertain you. I said, why are you so anxious to have breakfast with somebody that stole your parking spot? He said, well, I was hoping. And he went like this. He said, I was hoping that you might just be able to teach me how I could have what you've got, because I don't have it. And I can go to this day, even years later, whenever I'm in Washington, I go to that little restaurant. He never charges me. I can have six people with me, never a bill. He will always come and join me, and he'll go like this, do you have more to share with me yet? <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, wow. And when I look back on experiences like this, you know what I know? That it's not me. It's Christ in me. It's the mind of Jesus being made available to us. I love Ellen White's comment on this where she says, when we put on the mind of Jesus, we receive his thoughts, his feelings, and his motives. Did you hear that? I can actually have the very thoughts of Jesus in my own mind. If I'm coming by way of the cross, every time I gladly receive the offering of his son daily, God's response is to bring the spirit, to bring the mind of Christ into us. And we can actually be thinking the very thoughts of Jesus. And I've got news for you. Jesus' thoughts are quite different from mine. He doesn't look at people the same as I look at people. He sees the heart. He seeks to say words that will lead sinners to himself. He's so gentle with people. I'm the opposite, naturally. But when I give him permission to come in, the gentleness and the sweetness that comes out, it just blows me away. I'm seeking, by the way, to make this the habit of my life. Whenever I'm really tempted for the old bill to come out, I want grace to look up and say, please give me the mind of Jesus at this moment so I can think his thoughts and feel his feelings. Much more than the atoning death of Jesus is that we are saved from what? There's that word jumping in. We are saved from wrath. Or wrath, as they say in Australia. What do you say up here? Wrath, of course you do. <laughs> saved from wrath. <laughs> I was hoping to hear wrath again. <laughs> saved from wrath through him. I got stuck on that for a while. Saved from wrath through him. So I started to study Paul's use of the word wrath and I've got a very big question for you now. I know you want a little assignment. You're tired of listening to me. So here's your assignment. The first time Paul uses the word wrath in Romans is Romans 1. Romans 1 and verse 18. Now as you read that verse and you compare it with Romans 5, 9 and 10 and remember, what are we moving from? We're moving from the benefits of his death now to the amazing benefits of his life in us. We're looking at the true understanding now of salvation and I am challenging the old concepts that salvation slash eternal life is a length of time. It is not. I'm challenging the thought that it's a future development. It is not. It's a present reality. And I'm really hoping you will now open your minds and allow the great Apostle Paul to share with you his understanding of salvation. And it all hinges on this word wrath. We are saved from wrath through him And the through him, when we look at the parallel passage, is actually pointing to his life. 
It's about his life. So here's my question for you to have a little discussion with your partners now or partner. When God saves you from his wrath, what does he offer you? That's the question. When God saves you from his wrath, what does he offer you? And the answer can be found by comparing Romans 1.18 with Romans 5, 9 and 10. So go ahead with your partner now. Have a vibrant discussion and make sure you've got the question crystal clear. When God saves you from his wrath, what does he offer you? And remember, if your partner will not speak with you, feel free to change partners. Don't sit there in splendid solitude. When God saves you from his wrath, what does he offer you? If someone's sitting near you and they have no partner, tap them on the shoulder and say, we need you. Join us. Join us. Well, you could leave them sitting there in splendid solitude, of course. When God saves you from his wrath, what does he offer you? Okay, you're not, you're not on first base yet. You maybe need to talk to your partner here. Should we introduce you two? Oh, you have done, okay. Have a further discussion yet. <laughs> no, come on, start digging a little. If you don't hear Romans 1.18, you will never answer this question. Romans 1.18. It may be implied more than stated, but it's certainly implied. Good observation, yes. Hopefully he's going to get the fish back on the hook again here. <laughs> you were right on target before, man, and then you let it slip off. <laughs> hey. Good morning. Well, I mean, you can hardly fault that, but it's not what's coming out of Paul. You, unfortunately, and for you two, this is such a shock to my system, you're not on first base yet. <laughs> You've got to hear Romans 1.18 or you will not get this. Is that a look of comprehension or amazement? <laughs> okay. Because it's pretty hard to fault that, but you're not getting it out of Paul yet. So you, you, you're heading towards first space, but you haven't hit it yet. Yeah, it's not a bad answer, except it's not coming out of Paul, you know? You're not showing that you've read Romans 1.18 yet. Give us what? I see you're adding that and it's not in there. You've got to stick with the words of the verse and if you keep doing what you're doing but just use the words of the verse, you'll have it. <laughs> Things are getting out of hand here, are they? <laughs> Yes, yes, you've got to hear it. Been a little quiet this morning. Thinking, that's good. Very good. We have you down here for a reason, remember? We need to hear from you. <laughs> We're hoping you are yet going to come up with it here. <laughs> oh, no. I'm merely a teddy bear underneath. Don't worry, man. <laughs> If it was in there, I'd say amen, but unfortunately it's not in there. Sure it is. Where? It's the ungodly and unrighteousness who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Oh, so yes. Jesus righteousness, they just straight. You know, you're, you're kind of hearing it without hearing it, you know? Okay. So talk it over. This is your husband here, right? It is. Talk it over together, and maybe you'll refine this just a fraction because you're in the right direction for sure, you know? It's very good. Well, we figured it out, but we figured one thing else out. Oh, hallelujah. Usually what we figure out, we've got something else in mind. Well, I, I really want what Paul has in mind. That's all I'm interested in. If you can pull it out of Paul, you'll satisfy me. You know? 
If it said that, I'd buy it. It doesn't say that, unfortunately. That's the maritime version, you know. Let's pull it out of the word now. Pull it out of the word and you'll have my attention. Yeah, and there's not one of those words you just used in 118, is there? Am I... Okay. Yeah. And my question was, if God is saving you from his wrath, what is he offering you? Yeah. Let me just spell this out here. Oh, well that was an interesting little addendum there. Okay, hang on a minute. Listen carefully, by the way. Listen carefully. If Jesus is saving us from his wrath, what is he offering us? And if you're saying reconciliation, you ain't heard Paul yet. Reconciliation is ours through the death of Jesus. We are not focusing on his death. If you're saying justification, the boat has sailed without you. These things are offered to us through his atoning death. We are now moving into the realm of his incredible life. It's the life of Jesus that saves us from his wrath. And so Romans 1.18 implies this rather than says it, but it's a big implication there. You can't miss it if you're hearing 1.18. So one more minute, then we're going to hear from you. So make sure you're communicating with your partner and bouncing it off them so you don't make the mistake of coming back to his death again. This is going to come out of the verse. Well, I mean, that's not a bad statement. It's not answering my question, but it's not a bad statement. I, I can't disagree with that statement. But what, when God saves you from his wrath, what's he actually offering you? That's the question. You've got to pull it out of the verse for me. Yeah. Pardon? How difficult was that, huh? How difficult was that? I'm going to get you on your feet in a minute, okay? Be ready. Be ready for in such an hour as you think not, your opportunity cometh. <laughs> Again, you've come up with a whole argument that's not in the verse. So. <laughs> All right, listen very carefully because... We're running out of time as usual. I don't know why these sessions are so short in the morning. Huh? We need an extra hour. To, when you're teaching like this, it takes time for the digging to take. You're being volunteered. This is a distinct privilege when you get volunteered like that. Especially by someone who's as comfortable as this lady here. You know? She brought her own bed with her this morning. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 don't answer because someone else is going to get the first choice. Just talk to me about it. Well, hallelujah. You're, you would have been, if she doesn't deliver up here, you will be the next person because you are truly right on target. Praise the Lord here. Huh? We've got light dawning in two remote places in this room. Wow. And in between, I don't know if there's a great gulf of darkness or what. <laughs> but right at the back, our sister right at the back there. Where's our microphone? Oh, thank you, brother. The green lady, yes. Now let me, let me just repeat the question again. Shh, listen, she was hearing me carefully when I said it's implied in the text. And it's an obvious implication. So please stand. Uh, first of all, read the verse to us. The question once again, if God is saving us from his wrath, what is he actually offering us? Okay, so the verse reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So by implication, God is offering us then godliness and righteousness. Because? Because his wrath is revealed um, from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness. So that's what's implied. Don't fade away at the end there. Fading away? <laughs> yeah. well, have it stated one more time. You haven't stirred this audience yet. You've got to say <laughs> things three times and get more evangelistic each okay. time. And they will hear it. Say it one more time, please. Okay. Do you want me to do the verse again? No, just, no, okay. just the comment. Okay. If the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, therefore what he's offering us 
which is implied, is he's offering us godliness and righteousness. Are you all hearing what she's saying? If God's wrath is being... Thank you very much, sister. Very clearly spoken back here. I love the way she handles the word. And our sister down the front here could have done the same thing. If God's wrath is being poured out against ungodliness and unrighteousness, then in order to be saved from that wrath, God must be offering us godliness and righteousness. And that is the meaning of salvation. Salvation is God in you delivering you from your sins by bringing His magnificent, holy and righteous life into you. I want to challenge you here this morning. There is no sin, whether inherited or cultivated, no tendency even to evil that cannot be overcome and changed from unrighteousness into righteousness when the living Christ himself is in you. Because it's Christ in us, I'm going to say it again, it's Christ in us who is drawn to holiness and righteousness. Some people actually get this and their lives turn around dramatically. I was having a a laying on of hands uh, recently with a group in a church for the reception of the Holy Spirit. People who were ready to move into ministry, they were being anointed by the Spirit. And one young man, as I went to lay hands on him, he grinned at me and he said, do you realize that it's Jesus in me who is being anointed today? Because he is the one who's in ministry. And he's the one who seeks that daily anointing from his Father. He said, I'm just his vessel. I was humbled as I realized the depth of understanding that this young man had entered into. We put ourselves in first place all the time. Holiness, another word for righteousness, the same word, is a divine attribute. It was perfected in human flesh by Jesus. Not inherited, he developed that. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. In human flesh. And if you have Christ in you, you have eternal life. His holiness in you will rebuke unholiness and draw you toward the things of purity and righteousness that will glorify God in your life. The single biggest challenge we all face today is the daily habit of coming to the cross, partaking of all that God has offered us through the atoning death of Jesus and then much more being the privileged recipients of the very life of the indwelling Christ himself. So we can think his thoughts. Wow. That Frenchman was very lucky that I was thinking his thoughts. We can feel his feelings. We can even experience His motives. This is a purifying, refining experience to let the living Christ come into you. By faith, am I challenging you or what? I hope your picture of eternal life is expanding. I'm leaving you this morning with that profound thought that came out earlier, that eternal life is not a quality, it's a... Wonder, have you got it yet? It's a... It's a person. Eternal life is the person of Jesus. He's the only person in human flesh who ever lived a holy and a righteous life. And that is the life that is being offered to us. We're not replicating it. We are receiving it daily by faith. Did you know that righteousness or holiness, whether it's imputed that is credited to you through his death, or whether it is imparted, offered to you through his indwelling life every single day, it's always 100% the righteousness of Jesus. That's pretty feeble. 
You haven't got it yet. I have failed you miserably. I'm going to repeat that statement again just in case more coffins are creaking open in the morgue. I'm going to repeat it again. Righteousness or holiness, whether it's imputed or credited to you through the death of Jesus or whether it's imparted to you daily through his indwelling us through the Spirit, it's always 100% the righteousness of Jesus. There is in that garment not one thread of human devising. All the glory goes to him. What a God we've got, huh? What a God we've got. Let's stand together as we conclude this morning. Where's our microphone? Is that still floating around or not? Oh. I'm going to call on our sister over here. Would you be willing to close in prayer this morning? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are wonderful to provide that sacrifice mm. out of love for us. Mm. Unworthy, but so full of worth mm. after we have received your Son mm. in the sight of your son's life which is holiness and righteousness mm. and we ask that we will fall at your feet and accept that justification and that righteousness through Jesus for mm. Jesus sake amen 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 go in faith this morning amen